Chapter 1 Stay put in beingness, and all desire to be will melt away. That knowledge, which experienced itself as Krishna, Buddha, or Christ, has subsided, and has become one with the whole. So, if you abuse Christ, if you abuse Muhammad, if you abuse anyone, he does not come and ask you, Why are you abusing me? Because that knowledge, that experience has mixed with the totality. Similarly now, you may be a very great person. You might be a dictator of the world. But when you go to sleep, you forget what you were. Your name, your body, your age, your sex, your nationality, everything. This sense of a separate identity is very limited and not the truth. In fact, it is totally false. So if that is the situation with Christ, what is the case with you? Or you may be a humble, virtuous person. Whenever you go to sleep, you forget sin, virtue. You forget yourself. What is the basic fact? It is that you forgot yourself as an individual, which gives you deep rest. When you go to sleep, you might have had sex with a hundred women or a hundred men. At that time, you were enjoying it. But when you sleep, when you take rest, that sensory experience is not there. So then you do not have an identity, no weight at that place. Don't say you are so-and-so. You are an individual. You are a man or a woman. Just stay put. From there, you can move ahead. That is the truth. That is the fact. From there, you can go to reality. And then whatever is manifested will arise and subside. It is like sunrise and sunset, waxing and waning. That desultory manifestation you cannot be. It cannot be the real you. Whenever there is a sense of individuality, personality, or separateness, you have so many wants. You want to see a movie. You want to hear music. You want to play. You want to have sex. You want to eat fancy foods. You want to consume intoxicant. But when that sense of separateness is not there, when you are one with the totality, these things are not desired. And spirituality, or what you call religion, is mainly to understand this, that you don't require anything that you are a part of the totality or reality. When you grasp that, you don't have any of these needs. But so long as you are separate from things, you need everything. To exist as a separate individual constitutes the entire problem. And all of these things, the various sense caterings, all reading, search for knowledge, for pleasure, Everything is related to that. Once all that subsides, there is no more problem. Then the bliss you experience is true bliss. The foregoing, however, is not a ban on activities. Do whatever you want, but never forget the reality. Never forget what you really are. You are not the body. You are not the food. You are not this vital air, prana. Whatever has appeared is a state and as such it has to go. Most of you are not going to understand what is being said here, because you are taking yourself to be the body. Whatever knowledge I am conveying is not directed to the body, with you as bodily entities as different persons. So long as you are firmly convinced that you are the body, whatever I am telling you is not going to be of any use to you, because whatever knowledge we take, we take it as body-mind, since it adds to our existing store of information. We then feel we have become more knowledgeable. For example, tomorrow some astrologer or palmist may want to come and tell me. I would like to tell your future. How can he tell my future when I am not there at all? You would be happy when told, okay, you will be President of the United States. But with me, that is not the case. In various books they have written about God. Has anyone said what God looks like, what he is really like? Has he got a shape, 
certain qualities. A god with attributes is still time-bound. Once time comes to an end, even his knowledge of being god vanishes. Just like a beggar, dressed as a king, he may feel as a king so long as he wears king's clothes. Once he throws away the clothes, he knows he is a beggar. When we talk about God, we are referring to attributes. Loving, omnipresent, omniscient, and so on. Yet all that is still time-bound. Once that experience goes, what is there left? Well, anything that has God attributes cannot be lasting. This is very clear to me. So what then can I ask for myself? Whatever behavior exists in this world, it is because of attributes, tendencies. For example, a person goes through four marriages and divorces in a month. Now that behavior stems from tendencies, qualities. But that which witnesses this behavior is beyond attributes. When that witness itself, which is I am, subsides, what remains? With the witness gone, all other things have disappeared too. By the same token, upon the arising of the I am, the whole of manifestation takes place. These two are not separate. They are one. I am is the witness. The entire manifest world is there because of this. That which is doing all this are the tendencies or attributes of Maya. Just like the sun and its rays, if the sun is not there, the rays are absent. Similarly, if the witness is not there, the manifestation of Maya is not present. When I am arises, everything appears. When I am subsides, everything subsides. Now this is what I am trying to tell you, but you want something else. You want something about your future something which is part of manifestation. But I am trying to hit at it. You have been seeing me right from 5.30 in the morning, working, talking, and doing all that. But nowhere am I aware of myself as a yanni, as something different. On the other hand, I have not forgotten the child of many years ago. Now, 82 years back, I had the childish knowledge, the incomplete knowledge which was born from the ignorance that I was born. Until the age of three, I did not know anything. After that age, I was struck by my mother with what is a word. You know, concepts. And out of these concepts, everything else came. Now this Maya is that which started 82 years ago. It is singing. Maya comes up, subsides again. It goes in cycles, waxing and waning. Now, after some time, this childish knowledge, incomplete knowledge, whose base is ignorance, that experience, which started 82 years ago, let us not call it an identity, will also pass away, wither away. This I am is an announcement. It is not real. It has come out of something else. What the real is, I am not telling you, because words negate that. Whatever I am telling you is not the truth, because it has come out of that I am. The fact is, I cannot describe reality to you. I cannot. I cannot explain it, because it is beyond expression. So from that, everything flows. But every time I say something, I am aware that it is to be negated. Not this, not that. Nettie, Nettie, that is my experience. And further, I have not seen God, have not seen anything else. But about my own experience, I am very sure. And that is what I am telling you about. I am not quoting anyone. Because that food body is there, and that slice of bread, the I amness appears. Since this is dependent on the body, it is ignorance. Therefore, this I amness knowledge cannot remain permanently. It is a function of this food body. So long as the food body is present, this I amness will remain. Thereafter, it will go. As was said before, the same child knowledge that I amness still persists. 
the I amness view appeared in the child body, as it is here today. But because of Maya, continuous changes take place. The situation has changed, but I amness still continues. For how long? For so long as the food body is viable. When the food body is dropped by the vital breath, the I amness will set. So I amness is not permanent either. The consciousness is not permanent. Our prime minister has some firm ideas about himself and whatever concepts he entertains. He does not want to change them, ideas of God, etc. We human beings have so many pet notions, preconceived ideas. Whenever we listen to somebody whose ideas tallies with ours, we agree. Otherwise, we reject. Similarly, those yanis who state they are established in the absolute are actually in beingness. They are known as sages. They like certain ideas, certain concepts, and they want to propagate those. But they propagate only idea, and an idea is not the truth. Truth is the state beyond concepts. You take the seed of the banyan tree. It is very small. Smaller than the mustard seed. The seed is very subtle, but all the gross matter is already inside it. Do you see the paradox? Similarly, your essential being is the subtlest, yet it contains the whole universe. Another point is, what do you mean by seed? Bia means second creation, and thus signifies that the past is being repeated. It was a tree. The tree got concentrated in the seed, and the seed recreates the past history it contains. Visitor, the I am is in the seed. At this point, when one is aware of the I am, the seed to become the absolute, you are itself the seed. You are I amness. You don't grossify it even by words. The inner core, the self, what is inside, all this is inside that seed. Maharaj also said that the inner core is light. No, light here is meant only symbolically. It is not light, like this, self-luminous. Everything is truth, the absolute. This Brahman is created out of your beingness. All this Brahman is illusion, born out of ignorance. For your beingness, from the absolute standpoint, is ignorance only. Again, out of ignorance. This beingness develops everything, the entire manifestation. On the absolute, beingness appears, and out of that comes illusion. And illusion occupies the truth. So what is the way of reversing this process? Recede. Recede. The lion, wherever he goes, looks back. Like that, look back. Go to the source, the seed. When you pursue the spiritual path, the path of self-knowing, all your desires, all your attachments will just drop away, provided you investigate and hold on to that with which you are trying to understand the self. Then what happens? Your I amness is the state to be. You are to be and attached to that state. You love to be. Now, as I said, in this inquiry, your desires drop off. And what is the primary desire? To be. When you stay put in that beingness for some time, that desire also will drop off. This is very important. When this is dropped off, you are in the absolute, a most essential state. That is the exact feeling that came over us today. There is a certain sadness in realizing that, and yet greater understanding of the absolute. Sadness because that I amness was sad. You know that there is being, and you are going towards non being, and there are all the things of being, and you know that they are really nothing. But it was fun, it was a great illusion while it lasted. Your true state, stay put in that, it is ever there, in its pure state undisturbed. Only that consciousness, I amness, is consciously receding from the absolute. That you are present only. There is not the slightest movement from you. It is winding up the show. Would you say that a little more clearly? 
Yes, when you are in consciousness, you understand the nature of consciousness and you recede. Your progress continues. This consciousness is slowly extinguishing itself. Knowingly, it is disappearing. But nothing affects you, because that is the absolute. Just like when the flame is gone, the smoke is gone, the sky remains. Beautifully said. That is the Brahman of death, the moment of death. Watching occurs, the vital breath is leaving the body, I amness is receding, vanishing. That is the greatest moment, the moment of immortality. The body, the flame, that I amness is there, its movements are there, and I observe. And it is extinguished. The vital breath deserts the body, that flame is not there. You observe that. That observation occurs to you. The ignorant one at the moment of death is in great fright. He is struggling, but not the yani. For him, it is the happiest moment, the most blissful one. But the fact is that you are going all over the place, to saints and ashrams and all that, collecting knowledge in your capacity of being an individual. Don't do that. Go beyond. This amassing of knowledge is not going to help you because it isn't a dream. This dream will repeat itself as a human body, as so many other bodies, as an animal, or as a god, anything. This is not the point. Try to understand what is being said here. That is the only solution and will lead you somewhere. What is the relationship between me and you? I don't care whether or not you come here and listen. If you find it, you take it. If you don't want it, go away. The space in this room is neither against nor for, nor in love with. The space in that room, it is one. Similarly, I am not bothered. The knowledge I am giving out is like a stream, like a flowing river. If you want to utilize it, take the water, drink it, assimilate it, let it flow by itself. I am not charging you anything. You are spending a lot of money every day. Come on, you keep the money and take my water. Similarly, while talking about it, I take you to the source of the spring. There, water is coming out in a trickle now. This trickle subsequently becomes a river, an estuary, and finally the sea. I take you to the source again and again. Once you arrive at the source, you come to know that actually there is no water. The water is purely the taste, the news that I am. This body-mind is created out of mischief. So whenever I say, don't ask from the body-mind consciousness and you comply with that, it means you are out of mischief. You will not ask any more mischievous questions. After listening to these words and understanding their meaning, stay convinced that you are that. You are the totality. Then, out of that, tremendous blessings will come your way. You become a maha you, that is, you merge into yourself, union with yourself. There is only one principle. The principle is that you are. Because you are, everything is. Hold it firmly to yourself. What is your aim? Do you really want what I am talking about? You have heard what has been said. Now live accordingly and remain with it. You are indulging in worldly activity continually. Now, before you go to sleep, forget about all that and start reflecting on reality. Because we can all break away from society. And the next thing is, don't run from door to door. I am of the opinion that most of you are doing that, just amassing knowledge. There is no point in that. Take one sentence of what has been said here and stay with it. That is enough. That will lead you to your source. My word is knowledge, if planted in you, will remove all other words, all concepts. So for this purpose, I will tell you a story. One person takes another person to a hotel, makes him eat something. Afterwards, he tells him, in six months, you are going to die because I have put some poison in the food. So that fellow gets frightened. He leaves him and meets another friend of his and tells him what has just happened. This man says, don't worry. 
You see this glass? It is filled with urine. Come on, you drink this. If you do, you will survive. There will be no death for you. So that man drinks it. What happens? He didn't die. So with the first concept, I am duly poisoned. He is full of fright and convinced he is going to die after six months. Later, this second man gives him another concept that he is not going to die, and he survives. He goes beyond death. One of the attributes of life of the vital air is getting concepts, ideas, creation over and over again. Who understands this? A person who has searched for himself. Only when you do that you become aware of all this. The source of all happiness is your beingness. Establish yourself there. Be there. But if you get yourself involved in the flow, then you will come to misery. You understand what is the flow? All that maya, the activities. You try to derive pleasure from the activities. This is a product of the illness. Whatever I have told you, reminisce on it, chew it, be still. Because it would lead you to stillness that way. It will be clear to you that just as with the five fingers of the hand, this body of yours is made of five elements. Because of the five elements, the body is there. Your beingness, this consciousness, is the essence of what is to appear as the result of the vital breath, which is circulating in the body. And when that consciousness disappears, or the vital breath deserts the body, everything disappears. This should be very clear to you, just as this spark comes about because of this chemical ingredient of the cigarette lighter, everything is present only because this food is there. So you understand that your I amness or consciousness is there because of this food body, and because the vital breath is there, and you will be able to watch all these elements, your body, the vital force and your beingness. When you are in a position to watch all that, you get established in reality. One can get rid of habits only with considerable difficulty. Once the habits are formed, it takes quite some time to get out of them. Similarly, although you have got this knowledge now, what it gives you, you don't know yet. Because you have been associated with the body-mind for such a long period, to get rid of that will take some time. But for you to become established in the knowledge, reflecting and meditating on it is very essential. For that, it is necessary to quit one habit you are normally given to and substitute another habit. Now, what is this substitute habit? It is to think constantly that you are not the body. For example, if you observe yourself in a quarrel with somebody, observe and understand clearly that there is a quarrel started by your mind, but you are only its witness. If you don't participate, whether there is a quarrel or not is no longer a concern. All the worldly activities happen through your mind. If you think, I am the body-mind, then you are doomed. When you are absolutely one with Brahman, you don't resort to mind. There is no sound, or you cannot talk. You stay put or keep quiet. To talk, you have to take advantage of this instrument, the mind. So you need to get a little detached from Brahman. Then only the talk can come out. Chapter 2 Whatever has sprung from the five elements is sheer ignorance. The knowledge I am is the same in all sentient creatures, whether it be an insect, a worm, or a human being, or even an avatar, the highest kind of being. I do not consider this basic consciousness in one form as being different in any way from the consciousness in another form. But in order to manifest itself, consciousness needs a base, a particular construct in which it can appear. That base can be anything. It can be any form. But the manifestation can only last so long as that particular form endures. And until that consciousness appears, there cannot be knowledge of any kind. In sum, knowledge depends on consciousness. And consciousness needs a physical matrix or form. 
One must also consider the importance of the word. The thought arises from the vital breath and expresses itself in the word. Without words, there could not be any communication in the world. In fact, there could not have been any activity, any busyness, or business, for that matter, at all. The world goes on because of the word and the name. People could not have been identified without name. So the word and the name have great importance. The principle of naming every possible thing has been carried forward to the extent that even God had to be given a name, and that name, when repeated, has a certain significance. At an early stage of one's spiritual development, there is no method, no sadhana, more important or effective than repeating the name of God. Now there exists no particular reason for the coming about of this consciousness, so there is no explanation for how this see, this consciousness or knowledge I am, has arisen. But once it is in existence, it cannot stand still. That is, consciousness is tatamant to movement, and all movement takes place through the gunas, which are inherent in the knowledge I am. This consciousness keeps on humming and expresses itself through the three gunas. These gunas act according to the form which has come about, and that form has resulted from a particular food. Behavior and action result from the combinations and permutations of the three gunas. When people first come here, I always tell them that they come with the purpose of showing off their knowledge or trying to draw me into an argument. So I am aware of that, but I am even more strongly aware of the fact that such people have not got the slightest idea what they are talking about. I call it pure ignorance. It is for this reason that I say, don't ask any questions. Don't even start discussing until you have listened to the talk for a while and absorbed at least some of its contents. Then you can begin asking questions. How do I know that you are completely ignorant? From my own experience, any infant will take at least a year, a year and a quarter, or a year and a half before he can even utter a word. That word may not have any meaning, but to do so, what has happened? Again, I am using the word gungun, that which is going on internally wanting to come out. Thoughts, odd words, whatever it may be, and it does come out. Now, where did all that originate? Where is the presenter of the speech? Speech is only in animals which includes humans. Now that is still part of the knowledge I am, which is within them. This gungun is within the knowledge I am, which includes the physical form. The gungun entity and the knowledge I am and the physical form, that whole bundle has been created out of the five elements. So up to this point, the whole thing can be said to be entirely mechanistic and therefore pure ignorance. Now, there are some people who say, I was so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so in a previous existence. How do they know? They could only have sprung from the five elements, and before the five elements were created, the previous knowledge could not have been there. Therefore, it is utter nonsense, rubbish. There are many Hatha yogis who have great powers. Of those, I am the greatest. But I distinguish between Hatha yoga and Hatha. Hatha means insistence or persistence. You see, I persist. And what is this persistence about? I did not know that I was going to be born. How did I get this birth? That is the point on which I persist in finding the answer. I must know this. When I was told sattva, then what is sattva? Sattva is the essence of the five elements. In that essence, in that juice, lies the knowledge I am. But all that is still of the five elements. Then how did this come about? My guru told me the whole story. Thus I came to know that it is ignorance, and I know from experience that everybody is starting from there. Thus, whatever has come about, this sheer ignorance, and we are nothing more. That is what my guru told me. My guru further pointed out to me the fact that the only thing you have in which you can utilize to unravel the mystery of life is this knowledge, I am. Without that, there is absolutely nothing. 
so I got hold of it, as my guru advised, and then I wanted to find out how the spiritual aspect of me came about without my knowledge. That again is the result of the five elements. Therefore, I repeat, I know from personal experience that if anybody thinks he has or is something special, it is sheer ignorance. Even if this body were to last for a thousand years, any experience with it that has come about during that period is necessarily based on this I amness, which is based on time, which is a product of the five elements for which I have no use at all. On my pure absoluteness, which has no place and no shape or form, this knowledge, I am, came, which also has no shape or form. Therefore it appears, and it is only an illusion. Intelligent people, extremely intelligent people, come here and ask me questions, and I answer them. So what happens? They don't accept my replies. Why? Because they ask me from the point of view of identification with the body-mind and I answer them from a point of view which is without such identification. So how can they understand me? How can the answers possibly tally with the questions? Who are asking the questions? It is the persons who see themselves as existing in time, with the birth of the physical body as their base point. Therefore, they ask questions from that point of view. But that view is false. It is a figment of their imagination, purely a bundle of memories, habits, and imagination. They consider that as the truth, yet it is sheer ignorance, having no basis in reality at all. The date to which you are attaching so much importance met you when the body was born, and from that day onward you have been considering yourself as that body. What was there before the body came into being? Only that may remain after the disappearance of the body and the elements. And before that body is gone, on that final day, even the memory of existence during the prior period will disappear. So whatever happens between appearance and disappearance of the body is only a bundle of memories. Whatever you have accumulated is merely entertainment. All that is in memory and everything else will disappear. Now, if you had really accepted this through proper understanding, you would not care whether this body remains or goes. When the highest principle, this beingness in the body disappears, how can you talk? When that primary principle has gone, is there any value left? First, the beingness is to disappear. Then also the body will disappear. But the beingness will never know that the body is disappearing, because the beingness itself will already have left. When a child is born, after a year or two, he is able to talk. From where has this capacity developed? From the food essence of the body only, is it not? Internally, he developed this power of speech. The Maharashi has over 8,000 disciples, but does he speak of this knowledge? They depend on this beingness as the truth. They take it as the reality. And all deference is being directed toward that beingness. All spiritual activities are based on the feeling that this beingness is the truth. But is it not also the product of the food essence? And therefore does it eventually not become decrepit with the food essence? Don't you understand your knowingness naturally, effortlessly? Once you understand spontaneously, you will realize that it is also a temporary phase. This beingness is going to disappear. And in understanding this, you will come to the conclusion that it is unreal. And the one who understands its unreality is the eternal. Now, continuing to explore this thing, can you hold on to some identity that is exclusively yours, that will not disappear? Without the help of some food essence, can anybody talk? And can anybody incarnate himself without the help of a body? Now I have been invited to go by car to talk to the people of a village. Will anybody be able to understand this kind of talk what I am driving at? The problem is, after such a talk, might the people not obtain my address and come to get me? 
No, the locals may not. They are not such type of people. But the foreigners may try to attack me because I am criticizing Christ. I have indicated knowing the true position of Christ because he talks about the same thing. What was done to Christ might happen to me also because Christ started telling the facts, the truth, and people got enraged and crucified him. They dared to shed his blood. Since my talk will be beyond the scope of this understanding, some of the audience may become very upset and disturbed. They will say, it's no use, we must finish him off. It is because of the command of my guru that I am doing this, participating in all these talks. When I go to that village, I will have to discourse about God and purity. I must take the devotional approach. But if I gave the kind of talk that I am giving here, they would not be able to understand it. I should talk on their level of understanding, God, purity, and devotion. Chapter 3 The Ultimate Medicine When the five pranas, panchapranas, become purified, concomitantly the sense organs become purified and the mind also becomes pure. And when the mind is pure, the language of the sages becomes intelligible. Without such purification, it is not possible to understand the sages. And ultimately, that purification leads to self-knowledge, to the self. Does this purification arise as a consequence of applying oneself to meditation on the sense of I am? And is that one's central responsibility? I am referring to what we call the sattva signifying the essence of the food that you consume. This body is nothing but food for the consciousness. Now the quality of this sattva is the beingness or the knowledge that you are, the I consciousness. And ultimately you should know this sattva, what it is. But for the moment I will tell you this is the essence of all the food. Your question was whether through meditation this purification takes place. Yes. And how this happens is that by meditation, the sattva quality gets predominant, the mind gets purified, and the knowledge of the self is made possible. Just as the quality of sugar is sweetness, so the quality of the sattva, the essence of food, is this knowledge, this I, consciousness, or as we also call it, beingness. Just as the sweetness of, how can that be the quality of food? I am just not clear on what you are trying to say. Food can either be very tamasic or rajasic. It depends on the food chosen. Are you talking about food in terms of whatever thoughts, instructions we ingest, or just simply the gross elements we take in? Ultimately, the food has taken this form, which is the body. Now, in this body, which is nothing but food, an entity called sattva is present. There is some connection between this sattva and the food. It is not simply that the food is this sattva. The latter is somehow a subtle product, some essence of the food. Is that clear? It's becoming clear. Then there is also something called the mula sattva, the origin of sattva, original essence. Its quality is that you come to know that you are. So in your body that primordial sattva or mula sattva is present because of which you have the knowledge that you exist. Another thing concerns so-called sickness. If anything goes wrong with the sattva or the material of the body, there is some disorder which is termed sickness. How do the doctors rectify that? By giving you medicine. The medicine is also a kind of sattva, so that medicine rectifies this disorder and then the sickness is cured. Sometimes, Actually, this beingness or knowingness itself is the misery prior to the appearance of the beingness. You did not have any problems. They started only after its appearance. To repeat, with the form, the beingness appeared, the knowledge that you exist, and along with that came all the problems. So this knowingness or beingness is nothing but misery. Any comment on this? Do you agree? I agree with that, yes. Sometimes I feel that illness arises as a lawful consequence of what people do. At other times it just seems to be something built into the body that we do not understand and it just arises. It has a force, all of its own. 
and either it will be dissipated when something counters. Again, this beingness, the knowledge, I am, which I call uprado, is a source of trouble. As I said in the morning, as the result of happiness, this source of misery has also begun. In this upadro, in this primary essence, lies the knowledge, I am. You know that you are. I have no argument with this. You see, the quintessence of this body essence is ultimately the knowledge I am that is sustained by this food essence body. Do you follow? I follow it. Now, this quintessence that is the knowledge I am in the period of a day, there will be moments when miseries are experienced by it because it is in its very nature to experience those. Thus, with the appearance or happening of this I amness, miseries are bound to follow, a natural corollary. They usually outweigh the pleasures. This beingness has two aspects deep sleep and the waking state. I amness means that the waking state is there or the deep sleep state is there. So, how do you mean I amness signifies the deep sleep or waking state? I don't understand that. You know in the waking state that you are. In the waking state, yes, I know that I am. When you go to sleep, you do not know that you are. Isn't that so? That's true. So that means these two aspects of I amness are always there. In deep sleep, I amness is forgotten. And because it is forgotten, you are completely relaxed and at peace with yourself. During the waking state, to know that you are is itself a misery. But since you are preoccupied with so many other things, you are able to sustain that waking state. This quality of beingness, the knowledge I am, cannot tolerate itself. It cannot stand itself, alone just knowing itself. Therefore, that Rajoguna is there. It takes the beingness for a ride in various activities, so that it does not dwell only in itself. It is very difficult to sustain that state. And tamoguna is the basis quality. What it is doing is that it provides one with the facility to claim authorship of all the activities. The feeling, I am the doer. Rayoguna takes one into all the activities. And tamoguna claims authorship or doership for those activities. But understand fully that whatever is happening takes place because of these three qualities. Sattvaguna, Rayoguna and Tamoguna. They are not your doings. You are completely apart from that. I stress that time and again. This is the play happening in these three gunas. Again, understand you are experiencing this Sattva Guna, the knowledge I am. This I amness is experienced by you, the Absolute. But you are not the I amness. What have you to say on this? What could I say? I don't have any comment. What I am expounding here is not normally expounded anywhere. I know, that is why I am here. Having understood, realized, and transcended all these three gunas, I know full well their play. That is why I talk like this. I have understood, I have realized, I have transcended them. A number of sages having done all the expounding will only take you into sadhana, the disciplines that are to be followed. But this is a subject prior to discipline, subtler than any discipline, a most subtle one. And yet at the same time, the activity that he enjoins us to undertake purifies the play of those gunas in the sense that they don't keep drawing our attention back into the world. Because unless there is some responsibility in our part, which Maharaj insists upon as much as anyone else, the play of these three gunas will be just random, and you will be like a ball kicked around by a bunch of dolphins. By following what was said, it will be realized that whatever is happening is happening only in the realm of these gunas, and in this process it is realized one is not part of their play at all. Becoming more and more detached from all worldly activities, one transcends the gunas, and knows one does not dwell in their realm. When you are involved with the gunas, you want to have so many things from the world. 
But when you thoroughly understand that you are not these gunas, then you want or expect nothing. Is sadhana necessary? Sadhana, the discipline, is only this. The knowledge which is dwelling in this body, the quintessence of these three gunas, the knowledge I am, I am that. This is the initial step. You must be one with it. You must abide in that only. You have to think I am not the body, but I am that formless, nameless knowledge in dwelling in this body. That is I am. When you abide sufficiently long in this state, Whatever doubts you may have, that knowledge, I am itself, will sprout out with life and meaning for you, intended for you only, and everything will become clear. No external knowledge will be necessary. Is any technique required for the sadhana? Only conviction. And if you are thinking of any initiation, only the words of the guru that you are not the body, that is the initiation. Stay put there in that state. It is spontaneous, natural. That shraddha, faith. What is that faith? I am. Without the words, whatever you are, that itself is the faith. Now you have to elevate yourself to the state of Brahman. That I am itself is Brahman. This is the condition you have to develop. For that, is it necessary to sit in seclusion for a certain period of time? Until you abide in that firm conviction, probably you will have to go into seclusion. But once you abide and stay put firmly there, you know you are that only. Then, even if you are in a crowd, you will not have a fall from that. At the moment when you are realized, you are that. Other times you are only contemplating that you are that. You are trying to believe that you are that, but the moment the conviction comes, is that the realization? Yes, that is the moment to know. So when you are realized, what are the signs of realization? No symbols are available, because only you shall prevail at that moment. But will one see anything specific? You know, surprisingly, there may be so many things you see. You might see lights. All this illumination is due to what? To Atma Yoti, the light of the self, self-illumination. I have read in several books that simultaneously with the realization there is an awakening of the Kundalini. Is this a fact? What you are saying about Kundalini happens to him. I am not dealing with that. Happens to whom? To the one who is expounding that idea. I don't deal with those concepts. That is Muktananda's sphere. And several other people say the same. My approach is different. I don't expound that. Is the result not the same? Whoever attained realization, we are merely told about it. But there is no actual proof. We are told by the realized yogis that whenever they got realization, supernatural powers were acquired. Strange lights appeared to them. They went into a different sphere. Something terrific happens to them at the time of realization. You might also have visions of various gods. Anything might happen. But that does not mean that you should dwell on those concepts. Yes, but can those things happen? Yes, but in the process of trying to experience and observe all these things, it is easy to forget the way towards self-realization. Those people are studying, as it were, on the TV screen. That means they still want to be in an experiential state. They do not transcend that. What Maharaj is expounding, speaking the language of the Gita, is it Yanamarg? No, not the Yanapath. Abidance in knowledge is different. Yanamarg means you are walking a path. Your destination is the knowledge I am. Abidance in that knowledge. That is according to the Gita, Yana. Marg means you are always trying to walk. I do not want to do any walking. When you talk about path, you think the destination is far off and you have to walk there. The point is that you are right at the destination. So where is the necessity of any path? Is it easily attainable? Spontaneously, it is the natural state, the destination. Unfortunately, you are connected with various types of concepts and you are bogged down in the quagmire of those concepts. As it is, you are, is most spontaneous and natural. Again, I will put it another way. In the Gita, I do not want you to seek support in anything external. There are only two entities, you and me. 
don't introduce a third person or a third support. The dialogue is strictly between us. What difference is there between you, Maharaj, and Lord Krishna? I don't know what you mean by difference, for that term does not occur in my vocabulary. So if I quote Lord Krishna of the Gita, for my own satisfaction is it, if you don't enlighten me, who else will? The knowledge you are is Lord Krishna. Okay, so my knowledge, that is Krishna. My knowledge is that devotion is the easiest way, and either Rama, Krishna, or anybody, even Guru, you concentrate on that. Don't even think that I am who I am, this and that. It is better to be an ant than sugar, and with devotion you take his name, the Lord's name, or the Guru's name, and you get the realization. You even get the yana, by only bhakti, blind bhakti. Without even thinking who you are, what you are, that knowledge itself, I am that, will dawn. With conviction, realization will occur. If you have gone through all that, why did you come here? Having done all these things, the devotional path, the knowledge must have dawned in you. Again, one must ask, why did you come? No, the knowledge is not dawned. I feel incomplete. I was not crowing about devotion. I was wanting, so there is no question of knowledge dawning in you because you are that knowledge. It is already there. That is the only condition. By blind devotion? Why do you want blind devotion when you are already that? Because it is easiest for 99% of the people. I can believe you more easily than I can believe that I am God. I can believe that you are God. You are more godly. You are God. You are Shaktiman. I can't believe that I am Shaktiman. You will never be alerted to that higher state if you do not believe that you are God. That is Advaita, devotion. There is no difference between God and yourself. You are God only. Only I prevail. Yes, I know, but they say even Dveda, both will lead you to the ultimate. A lot of people may say a lot of things, but what I am telling you is this. See that you are, and know that you are. Just be that. Is Dveda incorrect? Can it lead to the same? There is no question of duality because nothing exists except me. Only I exist. I deal only with that highest, whatever it is. In the lower, everything is true on that level. But I don't deal with that stuff at all. I don't expound the initial stages. The time is over for myself. If anybody places full reliance on my words that you are the Brahman, you are everything. That itself will transform you. Whatever I am is the result of my parabda? What is that parabda, that destiny you are talking about? I know of no parabda, no destiny. In the initial stages in the kindergarten thinking of spirituality, I used to say that. To one who is receiving primary initiation into spirituality, for him these lessons are good enough, but not for my sadhana. For an advanced course in spirituality, I will not explain this. These concepts are rejected. If you don't like my teachings, whatever I say, you may blame me and are free to leave here. Can a man shape his destiny? I have said already, I don't believe in destiny. If you have been on the path of devotion, where is the necessity of destiny at all? With devotion, individuality has transformed itself into Brahman, the manifested. So how is the destiny needed for that? That Brahman state, the manifest Brahman, is not subject to any destiny. Is there any question of something good or bad happening to that Brahman state? He who is not one with the Brahman and still thinks he is an individual will always be thinking that something good or bad is going to happen to him as an entity conditioned by body-mind. What have you got to say? Your comments, sir. One of the things that I feel very strongly is happening in the West through the Eastern teachings from such representatives as Maharaj and Ramana Maharshi is that people are so aggressive in attaining things. And when they get bored with attaining material benefits and sexual satisfactions and all the transitory pleasures of drugs, they turn to the spiritual life. But their view of spirituality is still conditioned by the same motive for attainment. You have to understand in the West people go towards spirituality because they are getting bored with this objective worldly life. 
So one must understand what is the cause of the misery. That source you must find out. Is it not necessary? I believe it absolutely is. That's why Maharaja's teachings are so important, because it stands quite apart from the usual teachings. Second visitor. Well, I think that what my newfound friend here is still trying to understand is the same basic confusion that we're having much more recently in the West in that people associate realization with attainments relative to this whole chakra system. And it is not that at all. You know, when Ramana Maharshi was asked about this, he would say the only center that interested him was the heart. Anybody coming here will be liquidated. He is not going to get anything. When you reach that state, the highest state, then only will you be realized. Whether you are going to attain or discard, I assure you that you will attain nothing and you will realize that no attainment is required. Abide in the words I have spoken earlier. First do your homework, then ask questions. I would like to know from you what medicine is there which will help you to know that you are and put to use that knowledge you are. Maharaja's instruction, that is the only medicine I know. Continue to come here if you want to investigate what you are. Track down what that you are is. Investigate that medicine you are. And don't expose all and sundry to what I have told you. Keep it to yourself. Interpreter. To many he will say, don't ask anything but listen. By merely listening, they understand. Most of their doubts will be cleared. To that lady in the morning, he said, just listen. Don't ask any questions. That can be very effective, too. In the flow of the talk, many doubts will be cleared. He is sure of that. Why is there such a divergence between different gurus, rishis, and realized yogis? Perhaps they are not realized. No, this is to be explained as follows. Although consciousness is universal in the knowledge you are, and whatever knowledge there is is all common, its expression through the body and the mind is individualistic. There everything is different. Therefore the path expounded by each sage will be different. It is bound to be so. Although several paths lead to, they will lead to the same. Is it not that all paths lead to Delhi? The paths will be different, but the destination is the same. So you can't compare the path or what I am expounding with somebody else's. In your method, may I call it method? Have you noticed any CDs? No, but that is my own doing because of the commands of my guru. My guru told me, although you are realized, you will have to expound knowledge only. No city powers for you. I was very eager. I thought, I'll get certain powers, do miracles, remove the sickness of people. At first I was thinking along those lines as an initiate. But my guru told me, nothing of the sort for you. You have to expound knowledge only. There were to be no powers for me. And then he also told me, you must repeat all these bhajans three or four times a day. You have to do it. He said, for the sake of all the ignorant people, we have to do this. I do not want to take you by the traditional, conventional, tortuous ways. That is why my teachings are better liked by the foreigners, because none of this traditional, conventional thing is there. The worshipping, the rituals, nothing is there. That is the devotional path. But what I am giving you is Atma Yoga. I am not doing Bhakti Yoga, that is, Bhajans, etc. It is happening, going on by itself. Bhakti yoga means a devotee trying to link up with God. It is not only going on here, it is going on everywhere right from the ants. This means that everybody has that bhakti, even an ant wants to live, which is the same as bhakti. But that ant does not know it, only a human form. My question is, even a yani's bhayans are devoted to some god, say Krishna, which takes for granted saguna bhakti to the interpreter. Are you convinced by the answer? Then in turn you can convince me. Interpreter. What has happened is this. As a yani, he would have remained unknown to the world. That is what his guru thought. So he told him. When Maharaj asked how he could repay this debt after he got realization, you cannot repay this anyway. But if at all you want to repay, you must do bayans four times a day. Now the purpose of his guru's command was that when some bayan goes on somewhere, 
people were alerted to the fact that this is a place where worship of God is taking place. Difficult path to achieve Brahman or self-realization. Although we are attached to the whole world and are moving about in it, the root of our attachment is self-love, knowledge of one's existence. I like your teaching as it is the truth, so where is Rajneesh's moral sense and responsibility as a teacher? It is all fun. He knows it is not real and he wants to have all the fun. That is his idea and his concept, and he also wants to create a peace clan. If he is enlightened, how can he create that illusion? It is all fun. All of the disciples are ignorant, so he has fun with them or makes fun of them. I did a lot of japa and a lot of penance, but I got nothing. I eventually found the right guru, and in a moment, I was transformed. When I met that great guru, Sadguru, unfragmented, whole, unblemished, and complete, I became that. Have self-confidence of faith. If this knowledge is totally absorbed by you, you will not need any words or sacred recitation to achieve the ultimate. Whatever is created is by the knowledge I am. Waking up happens to the body. Something was aware of this body. The witness cannot be in the absence of the knowledge I am. Who are you seeing? if you are not aware of the I am. You have covered everything with this I am knowledge. The five elemental world is only the creation of this I amness. Is there any knowledge of the state of transition from the absolute to the I am? Don't ponder on that transition stage for the time being. Dwell instead on the fact that your own consciousness is the whole universe. And be there. Be cautious when such experiences arise that get you that experience. Be alert here to the I am, and all other experiences will be transcended. The next elevation will only come when you abide in the self. When you are convinced that all of consciousness is myself, when this conviction is firmly embedded, then only will the question of the next elevation arise. Dwell on the principle of that state for a sufficiently long time. All the greatness, significance, and magnificence of the entire world is dwelling in the principle you are and I am. That is the prop and that itself is the greatness. There is no other remedy, no other path, except implicit faith and conviction in the self. There is no alternative. You are still fidgety. The body does whatever it wants. You have all this excitement because you feel happy with the knowledge that you have received. Whatever knowledge you have heard and accepted intellectually, you have to be. Take it that you are that. That means no shape and no design. Whatever you see pertains only to that, to your I amness. Spontaneously it is you are that principle. Don't try to unravel this with your intellect. Just observe and accept it as it is. When do you get these experiences, etc.? Whatever is created is created by the knowledge I am. Do not pursue this path of running after experiences. Your own consciousness creates everything. Will there not be extreme loneliness from that experience of I amness? Be patient. Don't be presumptuous. You are asking a very deep question. You have to listen first, then contemplate and meditate. Only then can you ask such questions. I have experienced that complete loneliness. Seeing everything as me makes one feel very lonely. Why do you always fragment the witness? Everything is you. And that is the experience of complete loneliness. You have still not recognized that little remnant. First of all, are you fully convinced that you are not an individual? No. Then don't ask the question. Only when you are convinced that you are not a conditioned man, conditioned by body and mind, may you ask such questions. What is God? All greatness is because of the I am. There is no other path, only this conviction. This is it. 
The name and body arise from the I am. When hungry, if you want to know who is hungry, just observe. You think that you have understood everything, but it is not so. You are the one who is listening to all of this. Who has understood this? You are all that has ever been created. Only you are there. This knowledge is a new seed and it is just taking root. Who is the seed? This knowledge is ancient, Samatan. It has come from eternity, from the eternal absolute which is ever there. A seed appears. That seed is the I amness. It appears spontaneously. Its remnant is in us. This little seed sprouts and the whole world is created. If the morning talks have affected you, then any bodily disciplines will be redundant. They are superfluous and will have no effect on you. Do you remember the state that I was addressing in the morning talk? Both states are identical. Fully imbibe what I spoke to you about in the morning and become one with that. If you do not like this or cannot accept it, forget everything and do what you like. I will not leave you, Maharaj. In the case of a devotee, Bhakta, initially the devotee does not want to leave God. Later on, even if the devotee asks God to go, God will not leave him. God means the knowledge I am. The knowledge I am is God, Bhagavan. I have been talking for more than 80 years, but this knowledge still doesn't leave me. Is it not enough? What have you to say on this particular point? Although I am trying to throw the principle overboard, it won't leave me. And even if I wanted to, I cannot cling to it. What is the principle you can't throw away or cling to? Since everything is you, you can't cut it away from you. This knowledge of I amness is part of you. How can you throw it away? And where can you throw it? When you are established in beingness, I amness, you realize that everything is you. It is all your creation.